Whenever you want, Paul. Okay. What time is it? 4.06? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we should start. Uh, probably it should start in English. Uh, or actually in Portuguese. Boa tarde. Uh, vamos dar, então, início ao colóquio é, do Instituto de Física da USP de hoje. Eu vou apresentar o nosso palestrante em inglês. Um, so, good afternoon, and it's a great, great pleasure to welcome Professor Marcos Aspelmeier um, from the University of Vienna and from the Austrian Academy of Sciences to, uh, to present our physics colloquium today. Um, Professor Aspelmeier actually doesn't really need that much of an introduction. Um, I should maybe just point out that he's uh, still a very young uh, researcher who has made, uh, has pioneered several contributions in uh, quantum um, optomechanics, cavity optomechanics. Uh, and uh, um, has numerous awards. Um, for instance, he's a fellow of the American Physical Society. Um, he's a corresponding member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. He's a professor in Vienna and since 2019, scientific director of the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Um, so it is really, really a great pleasure, pleasure to, uh, to have him tell us a little bit about the interplay between um, vibrating structures, mechanical oscillators, uh, and uh, their uh, interaction through gravity and the possibility to explore eventually quantum, the quantum realm um, or the gravity quantum interface. So without further ado, Marcos, thank you so much for, uh, for agreeing to give this talk. Paolo, thank you so much, first of all, for the very, very kind introduction. Uh, concerning young, my kids tell me otherwise, constantly actually. <laughs> so I, I learned to accept that. <laughs> um, I, I, I taught my kids and they know I'm 32 years old. Oh. I've, been, I've been 32 oh. for a while now. Okay, you should you should come to my place and teach <laughs> my kids. <laughs> um, and also, uh, Polo, thank you very much for the um, for the invitation. Um, we had several um, interactions via email. Um, I, I really I would have loved to come in person, and um, we will we will make up for that. Um, so there will be opportunities in the future um, for you and colleagues uh, visiting us in Vienna, and likewise. And I already look forward to that. So um, also from my side, without further ado, um, I would like to um, introduce to you the um, ideas and current status of controlling uh, levitated solids in a quantum regime and the prospects of these uh, techniques and um, possibilities for studying the interface between quantum physics and uh, gravity. When we talk about the um, interaction between um, mechanics and light, so mechanical structures and light, um, I, uh, let's say, brief historical note um, is in order. Coming from Vienna, uh, and actually uh, here, I, I give my colloquium uh, from Schrodinger's desk, um, so I, I, I happen to have the um, the um, the, well, I think the honor of having, of having Schrodinger's desk here in my office. Um, it's, of course, uh, very natural for me. And also being on the same floor as the, as the Central Library of Physics that hosts the Schrodinger archive, uh, it's very natural to every now and then browse the um, letters and copies of letters that uh, Schrodinger uh, wrote and received. And uh, one of them is a very beautiful historical introduction into one of the very first encounters of um, the quantum mechanics of um, light mechanics coupling. And uh, this goes back to a letter that Schrodinger sent to Sommerfeld in the uh, winter of 1931. And um, the 
um, uh, letter is actually um, more, more or less starts with the sentence, you know, this fundamental question torments me more and more. So um, Schrödinger in this letter that he writes to Sommerfeld um, uh, uh, say, uh, complains about his suffering from thinking about the fundamental question, meaning um, what the wave function is actually about. And at the end of the day, it revolves around a question that we know um, is being treated by other people like Einstein, Bodolsky, and Rosen a few years later, namely, can quantum mechanics be an adequate description of physical reality? And Schrödinger comes up with a Gedanken experiment um, that he explains to Sommerfeld in his letter. And he adds this uh, very fantastic drawing. You see, um, it says here, this is a dot. Okay, and this dot, it says it's a Licht quant, so quantum of light, so a photon. And he has this, uh, this is lump here, uh, which says schwerer Spiegel, which means heavy mirror. So it's a macroscopic mirror that interacts with a photon. And he explains to Sommerfeld, oh, look, we have discussed in our seminar for hours and hours this very simple um, one-dimensional uh, case. And then he has this drawing and says, imagine now, that um, we start out with uh, the mirror um, in a momentum state that we know, like momentum of zero. And we know from our light source here, from our single photon source, we know the position. And now the photon um, is emitted, hits the mirror, and then something interesting happens. Okay? And he describes it here in his words. He says, you see, our mirror now becomes a universal measurement tool um, because uh, momentum and position of the photon are imprinted on the mirror. So he says in the letter, you see, I as the experimenter can choose now whether I measure a momentum of the mirror and learn something about the momentum of the photon or measure position of the mirror and learn something about the position of the photon. So in that sense, and it's by my free will, he says in the letter of the, as the experimenter, that I can choose which property of the photon I'm actually measuring via the mirror. And this is why the mirror is a universal, a universal measurement tool. Momentum and position of the photon are imprinted on the mirror, namely both are registered with accuracies, the product of which can be pushed way, be the, way below the limit of Planck's constant, which is a remarkable statement coming from December, 1931, because it takes another 50 years, so five zero years, um, until Reed and Drummond in a fantastic paper uh, actually uh, derive this um, as the quantitative uh, criterion for establishing entanglement, EPR entanglement between um, two objects. So this is what he's actually describing at a time where entanglement was not even coined yet as a term because Schrödinger introduces it four years later. And also the EPR paradox was far away. Now, um, you can see, you can view this as a first um, instance, as a first example on um, how the interaction between To the math, if you ask, okay, if a single photon is actually reflected from my mirror, by um, how much do I change actually here my wave packet of the mirror upon reflection of a single photon? And it turns out, if you do a very simple one line calculation, that's the change of um, the wave packet. So the change in momentum of the wave packet of your heavy mirror with respect to, let's say, the ground state wave packet extension or the de Broglie wavelength of such an object um, is negligible. So you cannot distinguish packet of the mirror before the photon hit and after the photon hit. So it factors out. And uh, this is why many, many people around the world in their photon quantum optics laboratories can actually observe 
multi-photon interference fringes when the when the photons bounce off of the macroscopic mirrors in the experiment. So for them, it's a feature. For us, it's a loss because we are interested in actually trying to generate this entanglement between light and these massive mechanical objects. So um, one very intuitive and fast way of solving that problem is actually um, to, um, uh, to add a cavity here. So add a second mirror on this side and you see what happens now is that your photon bounces back and forth many times. And instead of just having one H bar K as a momentum kick, you suddenly add F. So the finesse as a momentum kick, you suddenly add F. So the finesse times H bar K um, uh, as a momentum kick on the mirror. And suddenly you're creating a situation that could be interesting because you know the finesse of such a cavity, you can ramp up um, uh, by many, many orders of magnitude. Which now leads us to a situation where we started to think, well, why don't we just take this micro, uh, let's say a mechanical oscillator, so a moving object, solid state object, and put a mirror on top that can reflect photons such that when a photon is reflected, it exhibits sufficient momentum here, H bar K, um, on, um, uh, on, on our massive object that it really is pushed. And um, uh, so in addition, we now need a second, a very large mirror here on top, um, such that we form an optical cavity in order to, um, uh, to, to, um, uh, to increase the momentum transfer. And this combination of optomechanical interactions with quantum optics is now is, um, known as quantum optomechanics. So here's the idea in a nutshell, um, you take now a mechanical oscillator and um, instead of just having light being reflected from it, you make it part of an um, a, a electromagnetic cavity, okay? In such a way that the mechanical motion modifies the, um, the cavity energy. So a very intuitive classical way to think about it, you see you have a cavity, you send light now in, let's say a resonant um, a light beam, what happens is you see you push away through radiation pressure, this mechanical object, um, but um, the light that is reflected out of the cavity will experience a phase shift that is dependent on the position of this mechanical object. The more light you send in, the more strongly you push the object. So the larger is the phase shift of the reflected light that comes out of the cavity. So if you put now a black box around your cavity with the moving mirror, um, what you have now is you send light in and what you get out is an intensity dependent phase shift of the light exiting the black box. And now for those of you familiar with quantum optics or nonlinear optics in the black box, what would you say is in there? It's a care medium, right? Because a care medium is the one that, um, that, imp that imposes a non um, an intensity dependent phase shift on your input. So that means that such an optomechanical cavity, so an optical cavity with a mechanically moving element um, can affect the, um, the, the quantum state of light that enters the cavity. On the other hand, you can also affect the mechanics. And this you can see also in a very simple way. Let's imagine that you detune this cavity slightly. Okay, so um, such that um, uh, such that you, um, by, by, by sending light in um, and imagine that your, your cavity is detuned. So what you have now is you get a um, position dependent force because if you're, um, if you're detuned away from the resonance, uh, depending on the mechanical motion, you have more light or less light in, the, in your cavity. So, um, and if you have more or less light due to radiation pressure, it means you have more or less force on your optical mirror. Here. So uh, just by pumping a detuned optomechanical cavity, what you get is a position dependent force on your mirror. If you now uh, go way back in your education, your mechanics 101 course, like first or second semester, you have an harmonic oscillator and you add a position dependent force to your harmonic oscillator, you change the spring constant. So what we have just done is um, by again, using an optomechanical cavity, we have found a way to change the spring constant of this mechanical oscillator. Now it's a cavity, okay? A cavity means um, you don't change the intensity instantaneously when the boundary conditions change. 
the build up of the intensity in the cavity is interference effect. And it takes time for the interference to build up. And the time it takes is on the order of the cavity lifetime. So um, uh, what you have is now the, the position dependent force doesn't act instantaneously, but it's retarded in time. Um, so what you have now is a position dependent force retarded in time. It's a harmonic oscillator. Retardation time means you don't couple to position anymore, you couple to momentum. Momentum dependent force, the meaning you change the damping. So suddenly, you see, just by having now um, uh, coupling off your mechanical resonator to an, to an electromagnetic cavity, you can now change the full mechanical susceptibility of your, of your element here, both the real part, which is the spring constant, and the imaginary part, which is the damping. So we now have full control. We can change the quantum state of light that pumps the cavity, and we can change the state of the mechanical system. So everything we can change, namely the spring constant and the damping um, via the light, interaction. And this is actually at the core of optomechanical interaction. And of course, you can phrase that now in a quantum optics picture. And um, what you get is now you see that the intensity of the intra of, of the cavity field um, couples to the position. This is an intrinsically nonlinear interaction on the single photon level. What you can also do is when you pump your cavity strongly, this interaction can become linearized and you get the well-known XX coupling between two harmonic oscillators in this systems. Um, I should mention that all of this, what I just said, is really based on the pioneering ideas of um, Vladimir Braginsky, uh, that who started working on that since the early 1960s, um, who uh, uh, pioneered with this work also the early ideas of gravitational wave detection. And the architectures that you can have now um, that exhibit modifications of the electromagnetic um, cavities as a function of the mechanical element are manifold. You can have a Fabi Perot cavity with a moving end mirror. Okay, that's it's easy. You can have um, these micro toroidal cavities where you have whispering gallery modes where the light through internal um, reflection is actually guided here in this whispering gallery modes. Um, and the, you have momentum, uh, you have radiation pressure to the outside. So you have breathing modes of this uh, toroids that couple to this cavity structure. You can have dispersive coupling of membranes or particles to the cavity. You can have photonic crystal cavities where the vibrations modify um, the thickness density and hence the, 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 the resonance. Or you can even have um, a, a mechanical me element as the end, uh, as, as an element, um, uh, as a moving, uh, element in a capacitor, um, which is part of an LC circuit, which forms a cavity for uh, microwaves. So you can have now the full um, apparatus here to, um, uh, to control states of mechanics using states of light and controlling quantum states of mechanics using quantum states um, of light. Just for those of you uh, who are familiar with the atomic physics uh, world. Uh, another very simple way of viewing that is in a scattering picture, a Raman scattering picture. You have a, a moving mechanical element uh, that can scatter elastically and inelastically photons that, um, that are reflected from it. And um, you see that now for such an optomechanical system here in frequency space, you have the cavity. If you pump your cavity blue detuned, um, you can, in a Stokes scattering, um, Raman scattering process, you, cre you can create a phonon inside um, the me mechanical structure by, excite uh, by scattering a photon into the cavity, right? You have to get rid of some energy to scatter a photon and the energy actually goes into exciting the mechanical structure. In an anti-Stokes scattering process, you can actually extract the phonon from the system because scattering a photon uh, from a red detuned beam actually needs to get some extra energy and this can be taken from the mechanical system. Um, if this process uh, occurs in a coherent fashion, then uh, for the first case, the Stokes scattering process, you coherently excite now um, Stokes photons and phonons in your system. So this is a coherent excitation of photons and phonons. This is a two mode squeezing a, a process that entangles the system. And in the other case, 
um, for the anti-Stokes scattering photon, you get a coherent energy exchange between photons and phonons, which is also known as a beam splitter interaction. Um, in all of these cases, of course, to succeed, um, you somehow need uh, your interactions to take place on a time scale that is faster than the decoherence in your system. So the decoherence can be photons leaking out of your cavity or phonons leaking out of your mechanical structure, which means what you really need to take care of from an experimental point of view, that uh, you have both mechanical quality to prevent phonons from leaving and a high optical quality to prevent photons from being scattered out. Now, um, if we briefly stick here to the anti-Stokes scattering, um, several of you might, uh, uh, might realize um, and remember that this type of anti-Stokes scattering um, in a regime where you see the cavity line width is much smaller than the detuning, this is the so-called resolved sideband regime, is uh, the blueprint for um, sideband cooling of atoms to their emotional quantum ground state. This is like the, um, the fundamental recipe of Dave Weinland for making um, iron-based um, uh, iron uh, quantum computers actually work. So the idea is um, you have now here your optomechanical cavity, you pump it, um, whenever you scatter a anti-Stokes photon into the cavity, this can only happen by extracting a phonon. And if the cavity is leaky, so if the, 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 the kappa is large enough, then the photon will leave the cavity, taking away the energy of the mechanical system and so constantly cooling it towards the quantum ground state. We thought this is something we could do very early on. Um, so we started uh, back in 2006 uh, with structures that I just showed you. They were a little bit less um, sophisticated back then. We just took a standard mirror that you can buy from Thor Labs, half inch mirror, and we started to lithographically predefine the surface and etch away the substrate such that we had freestanding coatings on our mirror. And then we use that as the end mirror for fabri perot cavity. So here you see an example where the cavity mode is actually focused on one of these small cantilevers, which forms now the end mirror of this fabri perot cavity. And that's already it. Now you have your cavity, you start to detune it um, such that you pump on the red sideband and therefore anti-stoke scattering um, provides a cooling rate that should cool your center of mass motion down eventually to the ground state, unless other heating mechanisms prevent you from doing that. And this was the case back in 2006. You see, we achieved cooling from 300 Kelvin to approximately 30 Kelvin. So from 10 to the seven phonons to 10 to the six phonons. Well, at least the principle was shown. But um, the, 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 the problem why we couldn't go to the ground state was that the cooling, that the heating rate superseded the cooling rates by far. So um, what we had to do was we had to decrease the, the, the heating rates significantly and several um, ways to do that. First of all, we changed the, uh, first of all, we changed the mechanical structure. So we increased the mechanical quality. So decreased the dissipation such that leakage of phonons into the system um, was decreased. And so the heating rates were decreased and we already could cool down to like uh, 10 to 30 phonons. In the next step, um, we also put the whole thing in a cryostat um, to uh, reduce the amount of thermal phonons from the environment. And then in the last step, we teamed up with Oscar Painter um, to study now not fabri perot cavities, but photonic crystal cavities. So these are silicon nitride um, one-dimensional photonic waveguides where you uh, drill holes in um, these are periodic, uh, they, they, have, they're, they're drilled in periodically, such that a periodic methylation of the index of refraction forms a break grating for the photons that travel along the waveguide. So they are reflected, okay? So this is like, um, like a mirror. And you do that on the left side, on the right side, in the middle, you actually form a defect. So you break the symmetry such that when, when you now launch light here into the middle, you have a a break reflection in the forward scattering and in the backward scattering, which forms an electromagnetic cavity. Okay. At the same time, you have density modulations of the waveguide such that the mechanical motion is co-localized with the electromagnetic field. 
um, which means you have very strong optomechanical interaction. Uh, because this is the whole point that somehow your mechanical motion needs to affect your um, uh, the, the energy or dissipation of the cavity. And this was um, our first uh, successful demonstration of cooling um, a mechanical solid state motion uh, down to the quantum ground state um, through laser cooling. We then thought, oh, that was easy. Well, I mean, you see it already took like five years. Um, and uh, this was a four Kelvin experiment. So we decided to put the whole experiment into a dilution refrigerator, which, which was already standing in our lab. Uh, so we thought we just put the experiment from a four Kelvin environment into a 20 millikelvin environment. And we go from an occupation of, uh, I don't know, um, 0.8 immediately to 10 to the minus two. Okay. So um, this, was the, this was the hope. Yeah, I tell you what the reality was. Um, this this data so this data point was really achieved 2012, okay, the upper one, which was very close to the original one. So we didn't really improve. Why? Because um, well, you know, photons get absorbed in the structure, they heat up the structure, and the cooling rate um, uh, in a dilution refrigerator is much worse than in a four Kelvin cryostat. So it took another um, it took another four years. So until 2016, until we eventually um, reached the um, uh, ground state. So in, until we could eventually improve by another almost two orders of magnitude um, by isolating the system. Ever since the day we call a four Kelvin experiment in our lab, a room temperature experiment, uh, because operating at 20 millikelvin is a whole different universe to us. Okay, so um, next step. Now that we are in the ground and ground state, so we have the following situation. We have this optomechanical cavity, I already told you about, this is our photonic crystal cavity, which has a mechanical resonance at around five gigahertz. And we can feed in light here by just an adiabatic taper where um, we, 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 can, we, can, we can couple light into the structure. If you have a five gigahertz mechanical oscillator and you cool it down to 25 millikelvin, well, you should freeze out all the phonons. You should already be in the quantum ground state and you should be able to do quantum physics. And this was the whole idea. Okay. So here's the experiment. Here we teamed up with Simon Gröblacher um, to uh, actually, if I zoom in here, is here's the optomechanical crystal. Um, here is a adiabatic taper. So light is sent in here, adiabatically couples to the optomechanical crystal, and then it's coupled out again and detected. Okay? We have two different possibilities. We can send in a blue detuned drive to the cavity. We can send in a red detuned drive to the cavity. The blue or red detuned drive either do a Stokes scattered Raman process or an anti-Stokes scattered Raman process. So create a phonon in the blue detuned and actually detect a phonon because it's extracted now in the red detuned case. In both cases, you scatter a photon. So in the successful event of creating or detecting a phonon, you scatter a photon into the cavity. And now what we have is in the output port, we have single photon detectors that detect at the cavity resonance. So we are able to detect single scattered photons at the cavity resonance. If we started with a blue detuned drive, it was a Stokes scattered photon. So we know we created an excitation, a single phonon excitation. If it was a red detuned drive and we detect a photon, we know we extracted the phonon from, from, the, um, from the mechanical structure. Okay. So first thing you do is you want to check uh, what temperature you actually achieved. And again, here it helps very much to borrow the ideas from the atomic physics community. If you have a mechanical oscillator in its ground state, what does it mean? It means that you can always deposit energy, but you cannot extract energy. So if you compare now the Stokes scattering rates, the ones that deposit energy with the anti-Stokes scattering rates, the one that extract energy, you will have to observe an asymmetry between the two, if you're close to the ground state. So this is what we have done in the experiment. Um, so you see here, um, we compare the um, Stokes scattered events where we pump blue detuned with the anti-Stokes scattered events where we pump red detuned. And this asymmetry tells us that our occupation in this specific case was on the order of 10 to the minus two. Compare that with our theoretical value of 10 to the minus five, you see there's still a three orders of magnitude gap. And this is, as I said before, due to the um, effect of absorption of photons in the material. 
Um, still, we could keep everything down at the 10 to the minus 2 level by actually having relatively long duty cycles in a kilohertz regime, leaving the system time to relax and re thermalize again to low temperatures. Now, two examples of what you can do with that. The first thing you can do is you can generate genuine non Gaussian quantum states of your mechanical oscillator. Okay. What do you do is, well, you know, uh, again, you look back in the history of quantum optics and you look at the beautiful experiments, for example, of John Clauser and others, um, and you realize if you have a um, two uh, uh, photon source, in our case, a source where you have a Stokes scattered photon event that indicates that you have generated a phonon, okay, and then you come with a second pulse that reads out the phonon, then um, you can do. Um, intensity interferometry, you can do Henry Brown twist interferometry of the single phonon state of your mechanical system in order to probe the G2 function. And um, we have in our case confirmed that you have a G2 of zero that is below one, confirming a non classical nature of, the, um, of your mechanical system. What you can also do uh, in a second step. Um, you can have two optomechanical crystals, totally independent, separated. We keep them in the same fridge, but we wouldn't have to. Uh, we just didn't have only one fridge, but we could have them in two different fridges. And we send now a blue detuned pump, first towards a beam splitter, such that there's a coherent superposition now of pumping device A or device B. So crea you create now, upon detection of a Stokes scattered photon, um, either an excitation in device A or an excitation in device B. If you now delete the information where the photon, the Stokes scattered photon process uh, actually occurred by putting a beam split in the output port, um, you create a superposition of a phonon being created in device A and device B. So you have now a delocalized phonon excitation between the two devices that can in principle be arbitrarily far apart. And this is, by the way, um, the, um, at the core of the so-called uh, DLC set protocol that Juan Lupin Solar Siraf um, for um, uh, long distance quantum information process. Okay, so uh, this was a very long introduction, but I wanted to show you the, um, uh, let's say, uh, road during the last 15 years of many experiments around the world that attempted to produce mechanical states um, in the quantum regime. And um, it's safe to say now that today we do have in many labs around the world mechanical systems in the quantum regime. We have protocols in place. We know how to prepare um, the ground state by laser cooling or brute force cooling. We know how to prepare, for example, squeeze states of motion also by using protocols that have originally been invented for the uh, trapped iron community. Um, so for example, reservoir engineering, um, as was proposed by Serac and Sola um, almost 30 years ago now, was for the first time implemented really um, with mechanical systems um, or producing non-Gaussian states of motion like the type that I just um, showed you um, in this paper or through other methods and also generating quantum entanglement either between light and mechanics or between two mechanical elements. So all of that has actually now been achieved already. Um, and this is of course not the end, it's actually the beginning it turns out. Um, if you look at the prospect. So I just show you here in a snapshot slide the many facets of quantum optomechanical systems and how they are being used these days. So this really ranges um, from gravitational wave detection where only recently there was a beautiful paper where they showed how a mixed, so a combination of a squeezed input light and optomechanical interactions in the LIGO detector result in back action evading measurements that um, uh, beat the standard quantum limit and um, uh, allow you to measure uh, beyond that. It was, uh, was, was just a recent paper. Um, two um, new optical methods and materials for a precision interferometry in the IR and mid IR regime. Um, over photon, phone, and microcircuits. So, the really new ways and new ideas how to interconnect um, microwave phonons in microwave cavities, having circuits on chip circuits uh, that are now also being used 
um, uh, uh, in, uh, in quantum computing efforts as buses between microwave qubits um, or simply um, for converting microwave signals into optical signals and back for long distance quantum communications um, between superconducting qubits, for example. And then examples in quantum transduction and sensing. So here we are talking about using um, mechanical degrees of freedom um, to um, read out and mediate uh, long range interactions, for example, in, in spin systems um, to uh, really practical applications of uh, transducing radio wave signals in, for example, um, NMR and, um, uh, uh, you know, you know, um, um, uh, and, and, um, how are they called? Electro encephalographs um, uh, um, uh, using nanomechanical transducers um, for really noise free transduction of signals. On chip signal processing, so optomechanical interactions, optomechanical nonlinearities allow you um, uh, on a chip to introduce um, uh, uh, non, -recip uh, uh, non, non reciprocity um, for both microwave and optical circuits. It allows you to store um, uh, classical and quantum information in arrays of, um, of, 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 um, of optomechanical cavities and so on. And the last point is actually foundations to realize that um, such massive um, objects either can be used as very sensitive devices, for example, um, for um, uh, searches of new physics phenomena beyond the standard model, so um, one example I put here, the searches for dark matter, there are actually several proposals. Um, and the underlying uh, idea is that because of the large mass of the system, you have a very large acceleration sensitivity, um, which again allows you to be sensitive on energy and acceleration scales that uh, you're not, um, that, that, that you typically cannot access with other um, systems. So, um, having said all that, I would like to spend my remaining um, time on addressing another question. It's related to foundations and um, it's related to the fact that by using these optomechanical interactions, what we can do now is we can study actually um, massive objects in the quantum regime. So we have now a um, method namely optomechanical interactions to prepare massive mechanical objects in the quantum machine. And the question that I would like to ask is, um, is it feasible in principle that we can have a mass in the quantum regime and ask the question, what is the gravitational field that this mass in the quantum regime, so this gravitational source mass in a quantum configuration actually um, exerts, okay? So um, the question that I would like to address is, can we talk about quantum systems as gravitational source mass? So um, before I go into the details here, let me very quickly um, address what most of you already know, namely quantum systems as gravitational test masses. So this is something um, that is essentially um, known since more than um, 250 years now, um, namely uh, uh, gravitational sensing using mechanical systems. So, um, ever since the famous experiments by Maskeline, um, who actually used just the regular pendulum to measure the gravitational attraction of a mountain, um, measurements that were later refined by Cavendish in a tabletop experiment, um, do we have in physics actually tabletop precision experiments of gravity using mechanical oscillator? And if you look nowadays in the best Cavendish type experiments, these are certainly the ones by the Earthwash group in uh, Seattle, led by Eric Edelberger and Jens Gundler, um, who measured 
um, in this Cavendish type experiment with aluminum masses on the order of a kilogram, uh, the Newton's constant, or so gravitational constant with a precision to the fifth digit. Okay? This is the best um, precision measurement of gravity that we have so far. Now, um, of course, over the course of the years, people have learned that quantum systems are extremely sensitive probes. So um, not only of, uh, well, you, you name it, okay, electric fields, magnetic fields, but also of gravity. Yeah? Quantum systems are simply very sensitive probes of classical external fields. Uh, one of my all-time favorite experiments is the so-called cow experiment after the initials of the authors, Kolela, Overhauser, and Werner, where you take a neutron, a neutron wave packet, you split it in a single crystal um, Bragg diffraction, and then you have it traverse the, the, the two branches of the wave packet through different gravitational potentials of the Earth. So when the, new, when the wave packet traverses through an external gravitational field, a classical field, it picks up a dynamical phase. And the fact that now you have a superposition of the wave packets in two different um, gravitational potentials um, means that the interference pattern, so the, the interferometer here at the end, picks up the phase difference of these two parts. And upon rotation now of the interferometer, rotation means that you change the height difference, therefore the potential difference, um, you get gravitational induced interference friction. Um, you can even have something um, with respect to time dilation. So there are beautiful experiments with a Vineland group where you have an optical atomic clock on an optical table, which is actually lifted uh, here by 30 centimeters and by lifting it physically, you see a change in the clock rate, the ticking of your optical clock because of gravitational time dilation. So really moving the clock in a different gravitational potential of the earth. All of these experiments can be beautifully explained and understood in the context of, um, uh, uh, um, of quantum physics on a curved uh, space-time background, okay? So this is essentially quantum field theory in curved space-time and there are wonderful textbooks and explanations about them. Um, just to mention at the side, if I, if I forget it, there's also recently there has been the first experiment that really shows a genuine GR effect on a quantum property. Uh, this was the Kasevich group who expanded a wave packet to such an extent um, that it could uh, measure the effect of the curvature of the gravitational field of the Earth uh, on the wave packet. Okay, so um, and this is a um, uh, this was the first example of a genuine GR. Again, the question that I would like to ask now is: What about quantum systems as gravitational source masses? And the idea itself is a very old one. It goes back to Feynman, um, at least to Feynman. Uh, who uh, at a very famous conference in 1957 asked the question, how could we in principle probe the quantum nature of gravity? Okay. Um, so, because right now we don't have any experiment that would tell us uh, whether gravity requires a quantum description. Could we conceive of an experiment that would tell us that gravity requires or does not require a quantum description? And in Feynman's words, he said, so you should think about designing an experiment which uses a gravitation link and at the same time shows quantum interference. And he comes up with this Gedanken experiment where you have a, um, some sort of molecular beam type experiment where a mass carries a spin, then you have a stern gerlach type configuration where you coherently split your mass in a superposition of being there and there, so up and down, um, and then um, uh, so here is now your, this is now your source mass, right, which is in a superposition of being here up um, or here down, and you couple it now to a test mass, okay? And the question is what happens? Well, um, you see this gravitational interaction now between these two branches, and if you just assume, um, if you start out with the superposition of the source mass and up and down, and you have the test mass, and you just assume there's Newtonian coupling between the two branches individually, uh, then what you end up with, of course, is a um, entangled state. So if you put the, let's say the test mass somewhere, somewhere here, you see um, you have more attraction here um, between these branches, less attraction between these branches. 
So um, also the wave packet of your test mass will separate in these two and you get an entangled state if the separation of the test mass wave packets becomes large. This is the whole idea. And um, why now is this a um, sort of uh, uh, indicative for the quantum nature of gravity? Well, think about it in that way. From a quantum perspective, this is totally lame. Yeah? So basically you have, uh, you, you have two objects, they just become entangled by a classical external field. Um, this is nothing new at all. But think about it from a gravity perspective, okay? In gravity, we know we, well, we have learned that we have to think of gravity as a field theory and we have, we have learned to think about gravity um, as something where a mass configuration de um, defines the space-time metric in which a test mass um, moves along a geodesic, okay? In this picture now, how do we understand the generation of entanglement? Well, if you have a fixed mass configuration, uh, creating a fixed space time, and now I place a test mass, which at time t equals zero is separated, so separable um, uh, uh, from my source mass, then um, in a fixed space time, geodesic motion along a fixed space time metric will never uh, generate any entanglement. The only way I can generate entanglement via geodesic motion in a space time metric is if the space time metric itself is in a superposition. Okay? And this is actually the interesting part in this whole proposal that from a GR perspective, the understanding of um, uh, the meaning of generating entanglement in a GR geometric interpretation is that the space-time metric itself has to be in a superposition. Otherwise, geodesic motion could not result in an entangled state. This is what makes it interesting. And uh, there's a beautiful paper here by Christo Dulo and Rovelli that uh, points that out. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm speeding up a little bit just to making you familiar with the experiments that we are doing at the moment. Um, because what we are interested now at the moment is to ask the question, how can we actually enter this regime in principle, okay? Where um, one could test possibly um, such uh, behavior of nature. So there are two, two questions we have to ask. Question number one is, um, how small can we make a source mass and still measure its gravitational field? Because at the end of the day, what you want to have is, you want to have two small systems, small because at the end they want to, they should be quantum, uh, couple gravitationally and only gravitationally in the ideal case, okay? So that means from a pure experimental physics point of view, I better know what to do to isolate gravity as a coupling force from two microscopic objects, okay? Um, and this is what we want to learn. So this is one experiment that we are uh, currently trying. So we want to understand how small can we make a source mass and still measure its gravitational field. So here's a plot, okay? So forget about the y-axis for a second. This is just um, a plot of current experiments in the gravity domain where gravity um, uh, is measured from a earthbound source mass, okay? And you see, well, the smallest source mass um, at least um, this, this is from a, a few months ago, um, was on the order of a gram, okay? So there are beautiful experiments by Mitrofanov, also by the Earthwash group. So this is like the, this is like the scale, okay? So question is, can we do better? And uh, the answer is yes. I just tell you very quickly. We have come up with an experiment. Um, it's a very simple experiment. The idea is also very simple. We thought, well, you know, the beauty of having a small source mass is um, so here's a source mass, it's small. Small means you can actually, um, you can actually modulate the position yeah, quite fast. Um, and uh, this is what we do as a function of time here. Um, we actually modulate the, we modulate the amplitude, what, which means that at the position of the test mass, so this is the source mass, at the position of the test mass, we generate a time dependent uh, gravitational potential that starts to ring up the test mass. Okay, so we have a displacement of the source mass that is just modulated with an amplitude and a frequency, and that creates now at the position of the test mass 
a time dependent acceleration, which is just given here by Newtonian acceleration. And because of the nonlinearity of the Newtonian potential, we have a linear contribution, so just a linear response of your, of your test mass, but also a quadratic response. So if you get a higher order response um, of your test mass because of the nonlinearity of the gravitational potential. Um, the whole experiment looks like that. We have a source mass that uh, sits on a titanium rod and that is modulated like that. We have a test mass, which is part of a torsional pendulum. So it's really like a Cavendish type experiment. The torsional pendulum is read out as a mirror here just by an optical lever. And the, the source mass itself is on the order of 90 milligram. Um, so it's a one millimeter, you see it here, one millimeter gold sphere that is modulated with an amplitude of four millimeter and the smallest distance, the smallest separation between the two masses is in the order of 400 micrometers. The whole thing is shielded by Faraday shield just to really exclude um, um, some residual electromagnetic interactions. And having all these parameters at hand, the acceleration modulation of the test mass is on the order of 10 to the minus 11 G. So 10 to the minus 10 meter per second squared. Um, which corresponds to, with these numbers that we have here, a modulation amplitude on the order of a few nanometers that we have to read out in this experiment. Now, the challenge in such experiments, and this is also a lesson for the future, is, of course, then, that it's not only the gravitational potential that shakes up your mass, okay? It's also the local tram traffic. It's also the local pedestrian traffic. Um, and if we, without having any gravitational source mass, just look at the response of our pendulum to the background noise uh, of our environment, it's quite funny to see. You see black means no response, yellow means a lot of response, and this is frequency versus time. You see that in a frequency we have strong response at the pendulum resonance frequency, which is on the order of 10 millihertz. Uh, which coincides with the traffic light cycle of a road crossing, which is like uh, 60 meters away from our lab. So it's actually the tram stopping, um, the car stopping, accelerating again. It's a mixture of magnetic and, and seismic noise. Um, and then you have these blue lines here, which is when the tram stops during the night. So this is where, where we have no tram traffic. And even there, you see there are, there are, there are dark lines and there are less dark lines. And these less dark lines, happen every uh, um, seventh day for two days, uh, which is actually Friday night and Saturday night. This is when people are out on the streets. So you also see that. So you see you're very sensitive to the environment. So you better shield it very well. Um, and this is what we, what we had to do at the end of the day. Uh, here's the result of our measurement. So we were able to see here the, dis the, the spectral um, displacement. Um, uh, and uh, you see uh, here the, um, the, the, the linear response, the response of our pendulum to our drive of the source mass and the higher order, so the second order response. Um, so we see both linear and nonlinear coupling to the gravitational field um, through our drive um, of the source mass. And this is really the, the, the force signal. The, um, uh, and here you see the force residual. So we subtract the expected ones. And they are really flat. So we, um, this is really a gravitational signal as we expected. Um, the, as expected, the accelerator modul acceleration modulation is in the order of 10 to the minus 11 G. Um, but the precision of the measurement is actually on the percent level. So we really resolve 10 to the minus 13 G in our experiment with the torsional pendulum. And the accuracy is 10%. So it's on the order of 10 to the minus 12 G. Um, the other, so the accuracy is only 10% because we did not uh, design this thing to be a precision measurement. Um, uh, so this, in the 10%, we have all the typical systematics that we understand. Okay, so I'm coming to the end. This was the classical part. Let me just address the, the second question. So we have now uh, taken over the, the gravity part and we already have extended now this part, you see, to the regime um, on the order uh, of 10 to the minus five kilograms. So we already extended the gravity regime. This is now, right now, our experiment this is the smallest gravitational source mass where people had really measured the gravitational field of. And um, we think that we know how to actually push that even further. Our next stop is actually want to measure the gravitational um, source mass effect, the gravitational field um, emanating from a Planck mass. So this is our next experiment.
But um, the second question now I want to ask is, um, how massive can we make our quantum system? You see, if I look at the quantum systems around in, um, uh, in spatial superpositions around the world, so matter wave interference experiments, solid state mechanical resonators, um, they all, uh, so they, 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 they increase in mass here, but also go down in coherence time. So what I really would like to have is, I would like to have large coherence times on a second scale, um, but at even larger masses. So basically going um, into solid state systems. So I want to combine some of the ability to have long coherence times with the ability to have many atoms in a small space time volume, um, meaning high solid state densities. And um, this is actually what we are trying now. We are trying to combine the best of the two possible worlds. So we're trying to combine solid state quantum optomechanics with free fall matter wave interferometry by simply uh, cutting the support here of a solid state system. So don't have this micro mechanical resonator being connected to some uh, solid state background, but actually take a solid and trap it in an external potential. This has many, many advantages. So first of all, you're not confined now to the harmonic potential. You can simply switch off the trap and actually then have free fall propagation, for example. You can invert the trap, have an have a, have a, have a, have a, um, inverted potential, and so on, okay? So there are many, and you, you, you don't rely anymore on internal dissipation. So internal friction here in the material, which is a huge part to the losses here, uh, does not play a role anymore because you just have the solid uh, center of mass degree freedom coupled to the external potential. Um, so this is what we are doing. Um, we, we use optical um, trapping. That's a very simple technique that was pioneered by Art Ashken, um, where the main idea is you have a dielectric object, you have a laser that you, that you focus on there. Um, you see, since it's dielectric, the actual um, interaction between the laser light and the dielectric object is a dipole interaction. So the potential energy of the particle in the external laser field is actually uh, the dipole moment times the electric field. The dipole moment is an induced dipole of the electric field, so it's the polarizability times the electric field. So you see that the potential landscape for the particle is given simply by the intensity of the laser beam. So if I, if I have a Gaussian laser beam um, intensity profile, then the potential is just the inverted Gaussian and for small um, displacements, this is simply a um, harmonic trap. And since you have that feature here in all three directions for a focused laser beam, uh, you have a 3D harmonic trap of a dielectric particle, in our case, on the order of 150 nanometers in diameter in the focus of a laser beam. So um, this is how it looks like. You have a microscope objective. The laser is focused very strongly down and trapped in a nanoparticle in the focus of the laser beam. Now, what you can do is uh, you can actually um, have your particle here in a vacuum chamber. You have a laser. The flight is scattered. You can actually use to extract X, Y, Z information of the particle motion. You can feed that back again to the trap to have a parametric feedback to stabilize the particle. And in that way, you can um, actually uh, reduce the pressure to levels on the order of 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus nine millibars. So really ultra high vacuum in which the particle now lives. The next thing you do is you want to measure the position very accurately. And it turns out, so imagine the following, if the photon is scattered in the forward direction, okay, um, basically by being absorbed by the particle, it gives momentum kick, being, re uh, being re-emitted in the forward direction, it gives back the momentum kick, the particle itself remains unaffected. So a particle scattered in forward direction does not contain any information about the position of the particle. The, the opposite is true for the particle scattered in backward direction. The particle scattered in backward direction, the phase of the light um, is directly related to the position of the particle. This we already had in the very beginning of our, of our introduction. So that means if I measure the backscattered light, this contains the maximum amount of information about the particle position. Um, so the forward direction doesn't contain anything. I can throw that away. Um, but the, the, the backscattered contains almost everything. So this is what I focus on. What I do now is um, I actually, you see in a backscattering, I use a, I use a, um, I use a confocal backplane imaging a microscope geometry to collect possibly all the photons that are scattered back. And I feed that into 
a um, into a homodyne um, measurement. Okay, by doing that, because I collect all the photons now that contain all the position information, I can obtain now uh, a, a, a position measurement very close to the Heisenberg limit. I can actually go down to 1.7 times the Heisenberg limit um, in a position measurement of, uh, of a room temperature object. Okay, um, so if you if you if you if you um, translate that into position sensitivity, it means that we can do now real-time tracking of the trajectory of the particle with a, with a precision of 1.3 times the zero point motion. So I actually resolve the quantum trajectory of the particle in the trap, okay? I can actually monitor it. And by using a Kalman filter now, um, so I use basically a stochastic Schrodinger equation to provide me with a state-space model that I use, where I use my input of the measurement to do a state-space estimation, um, I can have now the full quantum uh, um, um, trajectory in position and momentum of the particle. I have that information and I can use the information now to feed it back on the particle. Because I have it in real time, I use the real time information to provide a feedback signal onto the particle. Um, what I do is here, I, the particle is charged, so I can actually just apply an electrostatic force. Um, the feedback signal I derive from a optimal feedback loop. So I, I have an, an, an additional algorithm that minimizes the system energy. Um, so it's a so-called linear quadratic regulator, which allows me now in this feedback to stabilize the motion of my particle into the ground state. So essentially I just push a knob. I, I dial in, I say, oh, I want an occupation of 0.7. I want an occupation of 1.3. I want an occupation of 0.4. So it's actually, and, and this is limited now by my measurement um, uh, efficiency. And this is what we do. Um, so we can actually, depending on what we dial in, we have different phase based trajectories and we have an additional out of loop measurement um, that provides us with a direct uh, heterodyne measurement of the side bands scattered off the particle. And the side band asymmetry again tells us about the particle temperature independent of the feedback loop. Again, it's an out of loop measurement that confirms that we can cool to the ground state. And this here is really an image of the particle taken while it is cooled in the quantum ground state of motion. So uh, I really like that picture. This is like um, this is like our black hole image, just in the small. This is the first image of a silicon nanoparticle at room temperature photo being photographed while it's in its quantum ground state of motion with the center of mass degree of freedom. Okay. I'm essentially at the end of my talk. Um, uh, I just would like to note at the side that you can do the very same thing. So uh, ground state cooling of a particle, not by direct feedback cooling, so by uh, measurement and control, but by uh, simply, um, uh, again, atomic physics, by using the fact that the effective temperature of an optical cavity mode can be zero. Um, so uh, what we do is in another experiment, we basically trap a particle in a tweezer. We have an empty cavity. We stabilize the tweezer frequency with respect to the cavity such that if we detune the three tweezer frequency, um, we can, uh, can again have stokes and anti-stokes scattering. If the cavity is such that you resonantly enhance the anti-stokes scattering, you again um, take away the energy um, of the motion along the cavity axis. And if you do that right, uh, you can use that passive effect. So really just have a particle in a tweezer and just stabilize an empty cavity with respect to the tweezer field um, at the particle. You can actually cool down the center of mass motion to its quantum ground state. So this is also um, a work that we have done here. Uh, this was in collaboration with Vladan Buletic uh, at MIT and spearheaded by Uro Stelic in this case. So um, as I said, I'm at the end. Now we can do many things. For example, you could actually now, now we have prepared a, a ground state wave packet with three picometers. What we want to do next is we want to expand it. I mean, I, I, I would love to have a wave packet that is larger than the object size, okay? One way of achieving that is switch off the trap and just let it expand. Why not, okay? You see, you only need a couple of milliseconds in order to reach uh, the particle radius size. Huh? So wh wh why not? Well, here's the why not because of decoherence. Okay, so you have, of course, you have recoil because the trap is on. You have gas scattering because the vacuum is not perfect. You have black body radiation 
um, both from the environment, just scattering and being absorbed from a particle or from the particle itself, black body photons being emitted that all localize your particle. So it turns out in order to do what I just said, to expand the wave packet size in our case to the order um, of the, the particle size, we need a pressure on the order of 10 to the minus 11 millibar, which is not impossible. And um, temperatures of the environment on the order of 130 Kelvin, which is also not impossible. It's something we're working on at the moment and hope to report new results soon. You can play around, of course, now um, with uh, um, modifying. Once you have a large wave packet, you can ask, oh, how can we create non-Gaussian states of the wave packet? There are a couple of works that we have um, done here. Um, they were spearheaded by the group of Oriol Romero Isart, both for the optical case, where we um, basically can do projective measurements um, on a large uh, wave packet um, uh, or coupling, uh, for example, superconducting objects to nonlinear elements such as qubits. And you find it um, in these publications of the or, uh, Romero Isat group. And uh, just to point out, uh, we just have recently jointly Oriol's team with my team and the teams of Lucas Novotny and Roman Kidon um, have just um, uh, received an EHG synergy grant with which we want to address exactly that question, how can we create these non-Gaussian states of highly displaced center of mass um, uh, states of massive objects. My last two comments, one thing we need is dynamical potential landscape. So imagine instead of having free fall of the object, you now let the object evolve on an inverted potential landscape. How do we do that? Well, I already told you, I told you that the intensity profile um, is nothing else than the inverted potential landscape. So instead of having now, let's say a Gaussian profile, which gives me a harmonic um, potential, I could do now, here you see just the TM10 um, uh, profile in intensity, which gives me a repulsive potential. I can also do um, uh, superpositions of those to have like um, uh, quartic potentials uh, or double well potentials, well, whatever you want. And we can do that in real time. This is work by Mario Campini and Nikolai Kiesel's team here um, in Vienna, uh, whereby now we have like tilted double wells where we either have a single particle that can actually uh, go back and forth between the double well or where we have two particles and measure now the interaction, for example, dipole-dipole interaction through photon scattering between the two particles that are separated only by a few micrometers. Last but not least, um, uh, you might also ask, well, how do you want to combine it with gravity to go to really large masses? That's something we're working on. Um, you could think of uh, superconductors, for example. If you have an anti-Helmholtz coil configuration, you can levitate superconductors. Here's an example. This is unpublished work from our lab. We have in a 20 millikelvin environment, we have a 100 micron um, uh, um, antimon lead. Uh, sorry, tin, uh, tin lead um, uh, alloy sphere that is levitated here, um, where you see we have amplitude damping times on the order of 40,000 seconds and dephasing times on the order of 80 seconds of this object. Um, this is all in a, little, um, in a little cylinder that is also hung now here from small strings for vibration isolation. Um, and we are trying now to uh, also employ feedback cooling to the ground state of these massive objects. Okay, so now I'm done. Here's my summary. Um, what we are doing is we are trying to address right now these two questions. I think I have motivated why we are interested in these questions. How small can we make a source mass and still um, uh, maintain gravitational coupling? How massive can we make a quantum system um, and uh, possibly interface at some point these two domains? And our approach is to investigate levitated um, objects, levitated solids, and uh, using quantum control to access the regime of large mass and long coherence times. So we have a bottom-up approach um, to expand the quantum regime of nanoparticles to larger masses. We have a top-down approach to decrease the size of objects of which we still ensure gravitational coupling or measurements of the gravitational field. Um, right now, we still have a, a, bridge, uh, a gap to bridge of, uh, you see that here, 12 orders of magnitude between our 
sm uh, uh, for our lab, largest quantum particles of 10 to the nine atoms to the smallest gravitational source masses of 10, 10 to the 21 atoms. Um, but I think we have a, uh, let's say, good way of, um, of moving. So we, we right now, we certainly will bridge the next three orders of magnitude here with our, um, with our gravitational experiment. And let's see if our superconductors will bridge the next few orders of magnitude such that at some point we can interface these two regions. So I would like to thank all my people in the group. As you see, we have divided our efforts in several teams from optic levitation in cavities. This is mainly really with Nikolai Kiesel's team here at the University of Vienna, Vienna to superconducting levitation and precision measurements of gravity where the collaboration with Eric Edelberger at Washington is really um, extremely helpful um, uh, over uh, the question of how do we uh, shape potential landscape and use optical optimal control, like with the team of Andreas Kugi um, for, for control theory and um, really fundamental questions at the gravity quantum interface together with Chastlav Bruckner, um, Bob Walt, and also Anton Zeilinger. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Markus, um, for, as I already expected, a wonderful talk. Um, and we are open for questions. Um, so, Gustavo. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, I also want to thank you for uh, this uh, great, great presentation. Uh, of this uh, amazing uh, chain of feats over the years that you've achieved with your group is really, really fantastic to see how this frontier of this field is moving. It's really amazing. So, so thank you for that. Now, my, my question uh, is thank about you. something you mentioned. So, so in, in this issue of trying to uh, test uh, gravity at the quantum level or quantum gravity, you mentioned that in order for, for this to really test the quantum uh, aspects of gravity, you need gravity to be in a, or the, the metric to be in a superposition, a quantum state. Uh, so I'm a, bit, I'm a bit confused about this uh, specific uh, aspect. In the following sense, we typically think that these aspects of gravity uh, kick in at very either very high energies, the Planck uh, scale, or let's say very small length scales like the Planck length, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So it, it wasn't clear to me how you could be sensitive to these effects uh, in your setup. So this, this was uh, not clear to me. So it would be great if you can clarify that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I, um, I would like to um, address two points here. So first of all, um, there are two ways of um, probing the, let's say, quantum mass of gravity, okay? Um, the one possibility is you assume that there exists a quantum theory of gravity. And there are actually many, many um, theories out there, okay? So um, uh, there, um, there, there, there are many um, uh, theories of uh, quantum gravity, or let's say many features um, of quantum gravity, as you said, that typically um, these are um, high energy theories. And um, if you believe that these aspects, so for example, uh, some theories of quantum gravity um, uh, uh, predict or postulate that the commutation relation, the fundamental commutation relation of X and P has to be modified. Now, for the reason that um, if uh, momentum really couples to space-time curvature through the energy momentum tensor, so the strain energy tensor, uh, then the momentum uncertainty also needs to couple through the strain energy tensor. That means if you localize something extremely well, uh, the large energy momentum, uh, the large momentum spread uh, starts to create an uncertainty in the space-time that creates um, uh, sort of mini black holes 
um, such that you cannot define position anymore. And this um, occurs exactly at the Planck length. Okay, so this is like a, one way of defining actually the Planck length. And in a way to, uh, to take care of that, you could postulate that the canonical commutator has to be modified yeah? because you need to modify the Heisenberg uncertainty to prevent statements below the Planck length. Okay? So you need to confine somehow the, 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 the position uncertainty to the, to the Planck length. Um, and uh, if you do such ad hoc modifications at high energies, then you can ask what are the low energy consequences of such quantum theories of gravity. Okay? And it turns out that indeed uh, the dynamics of, um, uh, of, of massive objects uh, should also be modified if you assume that there's no energy cover. Okay? Um, I have not talked about that at all, but there's a lot of literature out there. Um, so this addresses the high energy aspects. Okay? So basically you assume a quantum, uh, you need to quantize gravity anyways, and then you just ask, okay, what are the features uh, that will be affected? Like the commutator, like some non-local, um, uh, uh, um, non-local effective uh, field theories and so on. And then in order to uh, go down to table of experiments, you ask what are the low energy consequences? And um, there you find many papers. If you're interested, I can send you, I can send you the references that, um, that, that prop them. Now, um, this is not what I was talking about. I'm going the other direction. I'm saying, um, let's assume we don't know anything, okay? We don't even know whether gravity requires a quantum description, okay? So what is the, I, I, I go to the minimum set of assumptions. And um, uh, what I want to ask is, um, can I come up now with an experiment where um, at least I require the superposition principle to hold for the fields in order to explain the outcome of my experiment. If this were the case, and this I can already generate in a, a Newtonian limit of a, of a field theory, okay? Even of a quantum field theory. Um, so even a Newtonian limit, if I have a mass in a superposition, then my field should also be in a superposition. And then I, as a consequence, then I should generate entanglement. So um, this is actually what I was talking about. I, okay. I don't make any assumptions, um, but if I would see entanglement, then I, the only way I can explain it is by employing the superposition principle on the level of fields which is then, by the way, also consistent with a low energy qu effective quantum field theory of gravity. So it's sort of the, it's sort of, um, uh, the, 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 the minimum, the, the, the least you have to expect if you want to quantize gravity. I hope this was somewhat clear and I'm more than happy to provide uh, more references uh -huh. if, you, if you ask me to. So, so, so you're basically testing uh, the superposition of this to classical gravitational fields in the in the quantum system of this. Yes. Okay. okay. And, and and I assume that um, so this is uh, I assume that uh, I require a field description of gravity. If I don't have that, then of course I have instantaneous interactions. Then everything is sort of totally trivial. Okay. So then I basically we we, we have to stop because then <laughs> anything goes. It's very clear. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Uh -huh. that, I, I thank you very much for the question. Um, Pierre. Ah, hello, thanks Marcus for the, the great talk. Um, I was wondering about uh, the rotation degree of freedom of your spheres, yes. and how <laughs> that Me could too. mess up your, <laughs> yeah, I, I know. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, how can this mess up your very nice uh, quantum states? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that, that's a great question, you know, and I, 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 I tend to ignore it, I have to admit, yeah, because it, it hasn't come up yet in our experiment. So it turns out um, we think we can rotate them. So we basically, um, uh, you know, because there's, a, there's, a, there's always some sort of anisotropy. Okay, so um, if we have our particles in the cavity and um, we can, when, when we start to um, use circularly polarized light, then just by the spin angular momentum, we can start to spin them up. And um, so we can see some signatures uh, be because, they, uh, because they are not totally rotationally symmetric. So they create a signature in our cavity field. Uh, so we, we can spin them up. Um, 
they spin up to relatively high frequencies. So in that sense, the, uh, the this mode is uh, is nicely decoupled from our experiment. So right now it doesn't play a role. Um, yeah. So I I, I think um, I think this is uh, this is the quick answer. Okay. Um, on the other hand, of course, uh, there's super beautiful experiments by David Moore and Giorgio Gratta from Stanford and now Yale, um, where uh, actually they look at the internal um, electric dipole moment because of defects in a material. You have a, you have a fixed electric dipole moment that you cannot get rid of. So even if you, if you discharge um, everything externally, you still have an internal electric dipole moment. If you now want to measure interactions between particles, they are not neutral. So you have a finite dipole-dipole interaction just because of defects in the material. And what they are doing, they're actually rotating the particles now um, to, um, to average out the dipole moment and have on average than two neutral particles. So in a way, I think um, I, I like that idea very much. And I hope that uh, this, this, we can use this feature. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but other than that, um, yeah. No. So okay, it, but, has, um, it hasn't messed up yet because the frequency oh. is so far uh, but so so I mean it's it's not uh, it's not acting as a thermal reservoir for your particle. No, because uh, it, because, because it's actually it's so much decoupled. So yes, um, yes, okay. exactly, exactly. Yeah, but but that's a good point. No? If you yeah. if you're not careful enough, then um, definitely. So because you could have situations where they don't freely rotate, right? Because uh, they could also just have like this. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how you call this motion. Right? Wobbling they, a bit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And there you need to be careful, right? That you don't end up in, in similar frequencies. We haven't seen that um, because right now the driving was either so weak that basically we don't excite it or so strong that it's just gone. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. Yeah, that's, yeah. need to work more on that one. Thiago. Hey, hi, Marcus. Uh, hey, Thiago. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I was just more of a curiosity question, wondering what do you think are the prospects of measuring the this uh, gravitationally induced decoherence, say by this gravitational wave background kind of stuff? Or do you think we could measure it one day? Um, if it so, I mean, there, there are two there are two points. No, there's one is um, the actual real. Uh, background that we have, and there are these beautiful estimates by uh, Serge Renault and others, right? Um, uh, just really taking our knowledge right now of the gravitational wave background. Um, and the numbers from their papers are a little bit discouraging still. <laughs> so I, uh, if, if I know there's this uh, paper from 98 or so. So it, um, I don't know if there are some more recent papers. Um, these numbers, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that one can, 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 one can reach that. Um, and then there's this other type of gravitational decoherence a la Penrose, right? where basically you have this ad hoc assumption that a collapse has to happen because it has to happen. Right? And I think this can definitely be tested. I, 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 I think that maybe even the recent LIGO experiment that came out in science last week, where they cooled uh, a collective um, degree of freedom of the of LIGO, like with an effective mass of 10 kilogram to 10 phonons. I'm, I mean, I, I actually asked explicitly Angelo Bassi um, what he thinks of this experiment. So my, my personal feeling is this experiment might already rule out like all of these collapse models. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But a good point for this, for this, for this actual existing background gravitational waves. Um, yeah, well, so I, I don't know. I just know the old paper by Serge Renaud. That was quite challenging, but um, it's definitely worthwhile looking looking at it again. Uh, now after all the all these um, recent developments. Uh -huh. Cool. Thanks, yeah. Mark. Yeah. And and by, by the way, uh, congrats on these beautiful papers that you put out. Uh, I, I didn't have a chance to follow up by email, but I I read all of them, and we we definitely have to talk <laughs> again. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Oscar. Oh. Uh, thank you for the nice colloquium. And uh, I have a simple question. Is it possible in the gravitational experiments to detect the existence of a fifth force or some extra interactions? Yes, yes. Thanks a lot. Yes. Um, so this is definitely something they're pushing for also. Um, so um, there are 
different um, uh, there are different motivations here. Uh, so fifth force is now uh, I'm I'm taking this name that you just said and using it in my interpretation. Okay. Uh, but I know that uh, depending on the community where I'm from, uh, either this means a very specific thing or it means a very broad thing. Um, so um, what, what I'm using it for now is just in general modifications of um, uh, Newton's inverse square law, no matter what the origin, okay? Um, and uh, it turns out that there are two possibilities. So um, one is really measuring um, the inverse square law at very small distances. This is something that the Edwards group has um, uh, right now, still the world record with 550 micrometers between uh, gram scale uh, masses. Uh, we think um, that uh, we can push that um, below the 50, mi the 50 50 micron scale. So these are experiments we're working on um, at the moment, um, at least on the, on the drawing board. And um, the, uh, the and the, the, the acceleration sensitivities that we achieve in the experiment certainly allow for that. At the moment, the only thing that prevents us from beating the record of the Earthwash team is, of course, that the Earthwash team had like flat masses, so it can go really very close. And in our case, we have spheres. So spheres is the most stupid configuration you can have because the center of mass distance is like maximized. Okay, so this is why we did not beat any 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 any. Um, constraints in this Yukawa type modifications. However, there's a second type of modifications where you can have fifth forces. Uh, this is, for example, so-called chameleon uh, field. So this is where um, you look at um, you look at um, uh, 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 like scalar uh, field theories. Okay, like um, new new scalar fields that are out there. Um, and one of these is either the chameleon or symmetron field. And these have very interesting features, these particular ones, that they, um, that they have a shielding mechanism for the interaction um, for increasing the ma large masses. Um, so basically what you have is an additional field that decreases when the mass increases. Uh, so that means this field will only become relevant when the mass is very small. Um, and so this is another fifth force that you then generate if it were there. Um, between very small masses. And um, even in our current experiment, we think we can uh, actually place new bounds on this chameleon field. So this is actually, we are working on that right now. And it's not so easy to find theorists who actually can calculate uh, uh, or can help us calculate really the, uh, the effects of the specific mass configuration. So short answer, yes, we can test it. There are different things we can probe. One we can probe right now already, namely the chameleon symmetron fields. And for the just Yukawa type modifications due to string, string theory or scalar uh, or, or, or um, some scalar axions, um, we need flat masses, but we think we can go there. Thank you. Thank you uh, again. Any further questions or comments? If not, then uh, I suggest we thank Marcus again for this really beautiful talk. Thanks a lot, everyone. And I, I really hope to see many of you in person soon. <laughs> I'm fed Likewise. up. Likewise. I guess. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> we are all. How, thank you. Thank you. How is the situation in Vienna, Marcus? Actually, very good right now, really. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, so traveling within Europe is um, is extremely relaxed now. Um, so we are we we are we are starting seeing each other again, um, having mutual visits already. Um, I can start uh, also flying in applicants again, right? Mm -hmm. Who really can get um, familiar to the group and um, all of these things. So, and we are hosting uh, a Quantum Foundations conference in September. Okay, so if you haven't signed up yet for it, <laughs> then, it uh, don't, don't, don't forget to do that. <laughs> in person or is it going no, to no, be? No, no, of course in person. No, no, it, it's, it's going to be in person. I mean, of course, uh -huh. we try to um, have not too many people, but right now the situation is okay. Uh -huh. um, yeah, definitely in person. Yeah. 
And I'm yeah. so right now I um, so up to like I think 10 to 15 people we already can have um, face to face discussions and meetings. Um, and for September, I'm planning my first group retreat again, where mm -hmm. then hopefully we can be more people really interact with each other. How about how about um, how about there in Sao Paulo? No, here things are terrible. Uh, really, Brazil thing, yeah. I mean, there's still something like 2,000 people dying every day. Seriously, wow. How about the and, vaccination uh, rates? Um, 11%, I think, of the population has received two doses. You are kidding me. Really? No, I'm not. Wow. No, I'm not. Um, oh, that's bad. Okay. It's, it is very, very bad. It's very okay. bad. No, I'm uh, sorry to hear that. Uh, yeah, Brazil is, is the epicenter right now. So um, it's, we, can, we can't even think of, of relaxing things right now. Hmm. Okay. Wow. So um, that's that's why I'm asking. I mean, I I, yeah. I know yeah. that in the U.S. things are much much better, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and uh, I've I've been there. I'm actually mm -hmm. going again. Yeah, you wrote uh, me that. Yes, exactly. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 a, it's a different world. It's a completely different yes. world. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, we so, have now. At the moment, uh, we have 30% who are vaccinated fully uh -huh. and more than 50% who are vaccinated for the first time. Yeah. And, uh, I think that's the key at the moment uh, to get these numbers up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and your transmission rate is not too big because um, even if we had more people vaccinated right now, as long as the transmission rate is still as big as it is, I think. Yeah, yeah that's right. Mm. If these last twenty-four hours, we had like a hundred thousand cases. You know, it's it's outrageous. No, this is totally outrageous. It's no. outrageous. It's really outrageous. Huh. So, um, so it's you know, I am fully vaccinated, and I I just act as if everything were you know like last year. Mm -hmm. Because the, the transmission rate is just too big. So, so you say 100,000 cases. No, I, I, that may be wrong. I, don't, I, I read, I just saw something and may be wrong, but it's really, it, it may be that many. It was a lot of, uh, a lot of cases in, in just 24 hours. And deaths are uh, about 2,000 every day. That's the okay. average. It's a big country, okay, but still, you know. Yeah, but still, still I mean, look, we have like we have like right now 70, 70 cases, right? And we are 30 times smaller than you, right? So which means in our case, it would be like two, so our, our numbers would be like 2,000 cases for you if you just multiply. Yeah, we have 2,000 yeah. deaths. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's, that's, uh, that's it's, funny. Yeah, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's uh, ridiculous. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so... So um, okay. this, uh, is going to, this is going to stay on for, for quite a while here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. We just have to cross our fingers that we don't generate too many variants within that time. Yeah, exactly. You know? This is exactly the point, right? I mean, now, mm -hmm. yeah. The How slowly we're vaccinating. Yeah. 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 So uh, So hopefully, you know, next year things will be a little bit better in Brazil. Hopefully. Hmm. Mm. Um, and we, we've been in, in huge turmoil, you know, from every single respect. So, yeah, well, yeah. not to talk about politics. Yes, exactly. No, <laughs> no we, we could just say, you know, funding for science. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to go into, you know, why this is being done or not. It's just we have terrible funding for science, mm. um, uh, except in the state of Sao Paulo, where things are not as bad as elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so being in the state of Sao Paulo now is very, very different from being in the rest of the country mm. with respect to funding. Yeah, and uh, this is a statement that concerns science funding in general, or is it uh, more quantum related? Because no, quantum no, no. right now, there's no, there's no quantum there is hype no... effect. 
So there is uh, some hype effect, um, mm. not as big as it should be. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people are working very, very hard to have at least one quantum initiative in Brazil. Mm -hmm. But it won't be at the federal level for now. Oh, so wow. we're working okay. very, very hard to have a quantum initiative at the state level in Sao Paulo. Huh. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. Okay. okay. Um, but, but at the federal level, it's, it's just impossible. Huh. I mean, it's, uh, right now it's impossible. Hmm. Hopefully, we will have something in place next year in the state of Sao Paulo, and hopefully other states will follow suit, and then eventually mm. it will contaminate, you know, at the federal level, we will have something mm. too. Mm. But, but it's, uh, it's, it's an ongoing slow process. And uh, we'll see. We, we will see. There should be some additional European support. No? We have to maybe, you know, secure better ties Mm -hmm. try to to establish some collaborations some stronger collaborations where we could eventually have some some kind of of joint funding yes this this yes. would help this was yes. this would certainly help and and yeah at least the political backing also yeah huh, i think mm -hmm. i have a question for you Kaui. yes i see it mm -hmm. Uh, Professor Aspelmeyer, uh, just one question. Uh, it, it came to my mind. It's about the presentation. Uh, I'm aware of the limits of uh, an optical mechanical measurement that are related with the how much light you can extract. You, you can extract from from your cavity. The ratio between the light absorbing in the cavity and the light that it, that you can extract. Uh, for feedback cooling uh, experiments, this is kind of the lim limiting factor to, to how, how much you can cue you, your mechanical system. How hard is it to do this kind of, uh, such a precision in, in your system? Is, is it uh, much harder to do a feedback cooling in your case than to do the capacity cooling with the external cavities? How do you compare yeah. the complexity of the systems and how about the noise that comes with the electrons and all of this in the uh, feedback? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very beautiful question. Thank, thanks a lot. Actually, that's a question we are also uh, debating in our, in, in our group every now and then, right? Because we have now, uh, we have these two approaches, the cavity-based approach and the non-cavity-based approach, feedback approach. And uh, it turns out if you look at the right now, okay, um, the, the ultimate numbers, then at the moment, the, um, our, uh, um, in, so here, here I, I give you the group discussion uh, state point, is, is the point, right? So what you see here is that um, in the cavity case, what are the limitations? Um, well, you know, there's a finite sideband resolution. Right? So basically that you're, uh, that your cavity line width is simply not um, uh, due to the fact that it's not infinite. Um, you have this term here that, that provides you with a finite um, resolution. This limits us to like 10 to the minus two approximately at the moment. Okay. Um, then we have the phase noise in our system, uh, which also doesn't matter for the non-cavity approach. So these are these both things don't matter for the non-cavity approach. The phase noise limits us in our current experiment to around 10 to the minus three, okay? And then there's actually the reheating rates through gas and recoil scattering. And that is the one that at the moment limits us in our current experiment. So we have in the cavity case, we had a very bad vacuum with 10 to the minus six millibar. So we're limited to 0.5 in the occupation. And you see, this was really the limit. Um, if we would have better vac, if we would have had better vacuum, we would be much, much lower in the occupation much lower than also we had with the feedback cooling. So in the feedback cooling case, the limit is actually the efficiency with which we can collect the photons. And there it's things like, you know, we have optimized already the scattering pattern of the particle is a dipole scattering pattern, but you're collecting it in, a confocal in, the, in the confocal microscope in the back plane with a um, step index fiber, okay? So if you now calculate the optimal mode overlap between the step index fiber and the dipole um, image of the backscattered um, plane of the backscattered mode, 
um, you can get a maximum of like uh, 79%. Uh, and um, we have then designed an imaging um, apparatus. This was actually Constanze Bach's work, her master thesis, she defended today, um, who then experimentally um, realized 76%. So very, very close to the optimum. But you see, it's not 100%. So this is where we lose. Um, and um, by all these, uh, let's say, experimental subtleties, my claim is that the cavity would allow in principle for much lower occupation than the feedback. This is our current state of discussion. Needs to be proven because right now both are the same. <laughs> very, very welcome. Thanks for the question. This is really a very nice question. Just for one kind of, I, I, I'm not sure if I understood, but the, the issue is kind of how how close you can you can come for fiber to, to your trap. Kind of this is, and this kind of uh, limits the numerical aperture of, of the collection. Yeah. So in the in the end, I mean, the, the trivial question is, um, how much information about the position can you collect from the light? Okay. So because some photons can don't carry any information at all about the position. Some photon carry a lot. So uh, you need to, first of all, find out which photons you want to collect, and then you want to collect them in an optimal way. And uh, then it's a question exactly uh, like you said, it's a question of the overlap of the spatial profile of the emitted light with the spatial profile of your receiver. So in a way, you would like to um, mode match this overlap um, but it is not really possible um, to achieve a hundred percent mode match for practical reasons. Okay, professor, forgive me for cutting the discussion, but it came up. Really, I'm really, really thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. No worries. So, Marcos, thank you so much. Really, um, and. Uh, same here, Polo, really. I, and, I hope uh, we can meet uh, sometime soon, um, either, you know, at a conference in Europe or, or somewhere else. Um, we will somehow make it work. <laughs> it's, you know, it's nice that you know that your, your, your talk was, uh, was joined by people from, from different places. Hmm. And uh, I'm going to be a little bit... Uh, 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 indiscreet um, to say that even somebody from the U.S. Um, <laughs> just sent me a message saying that she really, really loved the talk. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I, I uh, really appreciate that. <laughs> a, a, Makes my evening. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a co-managing editor at PRX Quantum. Hmm. <laughs> Very good. Oh, I, I don't know if you know her, Katiusia Casemiro. No, I don't. I don't think she's so. yeah. she's co-managing editor at PRX Quantum, and uh, and she attended your talk and she liked it very much. I'm I'm, I'm very glad. I'm flattered. Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, come on, it's it's always every time I I attended one of your talks, I'm always just impressed to a point that sometimes you know we even look and say, okay, this is this is the real thing. So, what are we doing? <laughs> it's it's really amazing it's really amazing how brave you are how brave you are to take these challenges and try to measure the impossible <laughs> thanks Polo. I, I don't know what to say i really appreciate what you're saying uh, i mean i'm i'm just i'm just blessed by being able to work with a wonderful team yeah i mean uh, tiago you've been with us recently right so i i think well i, I hope you will be back soon we still yeah. have much to do. <laughs> I hope so too, yeah. As soon yeah, as we yeah. can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I have yeah. A, really, yeah, but thanks a lot. I, I have some people to send to you, to, to, to your team. I know, I know, I know. I mean, this is something, yeah, we, we've been in contact about that. Please, uh, yeah. let's not give up on that, okay? As soon as this is possible, let's just do it. That would be great. Definitely. <laughs> great yeah. talking to you, Marcus. And uh, Thiago, we should probably meet sometime as well yeah yeah we, we must i uh i didn't even know that you were at, at the catholic university shame on me <laughs> yeah I, i'm there yeah so, that's... <laughs> yeah but he, he moved only recently right i mean this is i think you have an excuse paula 
2017. Yeah, yeah, three years. Yeah, ago. but uh, you know, modulo, wow. modulo the modulo the pandemic no. that, that takes two oh, years gosh. off. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> we well, I, I should be more aware. So so um, <laughs> at least you see, Marcos. Like I, I got to you know know that Thiago is in at Buki and yeah, um, <laughs> it's it's my alma mater. I studied there. Seriously? Wow. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so so this was good too. Uh, okay, fantastic. well, so, thank, thanks a lot. And, uh, and again, uh, Paolo, thanks a lot for, for the invitation. I really appreciate that. It's always a pleasure. Um, and I, I mean it. Um, I really hope um, there's um, opportunities for personal interactions. Um, this makes it um, so much more um, worth the while. <laughs> and once more, thanks for your kind words. Yeah, yeah. It, it, indeed. But you see... Um, it's this and also the fact that even if we don't have it, you know, Zoom is making, is bringing us kind of closer together. No, I agree. Right. I agree. I mean, totally. Yes, yes. It, it, it makes this possible and easy, right? Um, so especially for us where the pandemic is still going to take a while, Zoom is... No, that's is, a good point. Yes. Is uh, I, yeah. keeping us scientifically alive. Yes, yes, yes. So we, we take it as a teaser, right? Um, and, then, uh, and then basically in, and the next thing we do is in-person discussion. <laughs> so the talk is now already given and now we can do the discussions in person. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we save time. Yes, <laughs> we can yes. go directly to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably already had dinner. Yeah, that's right. I already had dinner. I, I, I admit it. Because <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's what it's almost eleven o'clock for you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but I enjoyed but it I, a lot. It was worth. But I, I, I I did see there's people still around in the lab and everything, right? Yeah, that's right. Good so That's yeah. the way. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. thanks a lot. I, I, have, I have to whip in my corner. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope God. you're not broadcasting anymore. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. But I don't know, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's over. Okay, good. So I can take uh, it out. You know what? It is not over. Uh oh. This is all. This is I all on, on. This is all on YouTube. Okay. 